Hello, my name is Sheila Caldwell, and I am a member of the Johnson County Historical Society, and I was asked uh, to share some of my experiences in researching my family history and its connection here to the Johnson County area. Today, I'm going to take you on a journey, one that I only began about 10 years ago or so, but will probably never completely finish. I hope to learn enough to pass it along to my children and grandchildren so they can know and preserve the story of our family. Please know from the start, I am at best an amateur genealogist. I'm still learning, still making discoveries, deciphering between facts and family lore, correcting misconceptions, and learning how to discern what's factual. What I'm going to share with you today is what I've learned so far. It's imperfect in many ways, but I hope you'll enjoy it. Now, when we look at some of our German cultural influences here in Northeast Tennessee, one of the first things I think of is the food I grew up with. Things like sauerkraut and apple butter that my grandmother made. Um, and nothing made me happier than um, to have those kind of dishes and uh, absolutely loved it. Still, still my favorites. Uh, I think about the personalities in my family, steadfast, uh, strong, some would say stubborn, uh, very keen work ethic. And uh, we're going to see how the experiences of our ancestors hundreds of years ago still influence the way that we think and how we react to things even today. So moving right along, my maiden name is Stout, and that's a very common name here in the Johnson County, Carter County area of Northeast Tennessee. But growing up in Southeast Alabama, it was very uncommon. As a matter of fact, it would be my senior year in high school, which was 1980, before another person moved to town that had our last name. Uh, I remember asking uh, my pa Stout once when I was a kid, are all stouts related? Yes, he replied. All stouts are related, related rather, because God didn't need to do that twice. Um, could just never really tell when he was pulling my leg, which was probably most of the time. So today we're going to go on a journey. If, if you look where I have the arrow pointing, uh, that is Kuzel, uh, which is there in the Rhineland uh, Palatinate in what would become Germany. And you'll notice the spelling. There's quite a few variations of the spelling of our name, but I'll get to that. But we're going to talk about the German migration, the Pennsylvania colony, Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, and finally, Carter and Johnson County, Tennessee. So we're going to dive right in. So we're going to take a little time travel back to over 100 years before Germany really became Germany. Um, I've been able to go back and probably we could go back further, but as I said, I'm still on this journey, but I've gone all the way back to this area of Germany and Bosenbach in this area of Germany uh, to Hans Stout, who lived from 1595 to 1651. I hope I can continue to go a little bit further. So before this time, the people in this area, in this beautiful area of Germany were in a constant state of hardship. About 80% of the population lived in rural areas. Most were farmers and in many instances they were treated as a serf with absolutely no personal freedom. Uh, it might have been like one step up from being a slave. They could not marry without permission from the sovereign lord. They couldn't move anywhere else. They couldn't sell land. They couldn't obtain land. And so the social hierarchy during this period in time was determined by the size of your estate, your farmland, and your personal property. So if you had little or none, you were at the very, very bottom of the social ladder. So between this and the excessive taxation by feudal lords, to support their lavish lifestyles, it kept those people in a constant state of turmoil. So not only that, you had, as with the English and the Scots-Irish immigrants in the early days of America, back in the 1600s, 
religion played a part in the migration of the German people to the New World. The faith of a region was determined by its ruler, and peasants of other faiths were faced with persecution. So during this period, you had people that basically were living in poverty. They were servants or serfs of the people in, in lordship over them um, with no personal freedom. So you had that. You had some Germans, by the way, that did go you know, to the Americas in the 1600s and help settle Jamestown. Uh, so there were those that had gone on to the New World. You had a time during this uh, perfect storm brewing of famine. You had religious persecution. So if your ruler changed and was of a different faith, then you were going to experience persecution going and coming, just depending on who was in charge at the time. If you compile that with the ravages of the Thirty Years' War, when invading armies burned down towns and crops across the region, this was in the early mid 1600s. So you had a lot of that going on. Plus, you had this fella, and it was about real estate. In addition to his renewed persecution of the Protestants, King Louis XIV of France wanted to expand the borders of his country. It was all a land grab. It was all about you know, you, you couldn't, you can only tax people so much. It's kind of like the old getting, a, you know, blood out of a turnip, but you could go and invade other lands and take those people and then add that to your coffers. And so this uh, Europe was constantly in a state of turmoil. And because Germany was not yet a unified country, um, you had a lot of that going on, the invasions and the wars constantly. And so you've got all of this going on with these people. So you can see why there were so much um, turmoil there and so much unrest, because this went on for decades. And if that wasn't enough during this time to add insult to injury, a European wide famine from 1740 to 1741 made life there absolutely unbearable. All of these hardships finally got to the point that the people said enough and they left in droves. In fact, that region of Germany would lose hundreds of thousands of its inhabitants in a relatively short period of time. And part of that was thanks to this fella. We grew up in American history class in school learning about William Penn. It was this Quaker who would recruit unhappy German, German families rather to come to America. Now Penn, who founded Pennsylvania, wanted to make his colony a haven for all Protestants. And with the persecution that followed the Prote uh, protest Protestant Reformation, I'll get it out, it was an easy pitch. Penn personally traveled to Palatinate in 1682 to talk to the people there and asked them to make Pennsylvania their new home. So in October of 1683, 13 German families, the first organized group, packed up, left and landed in Philadelphia and established Germantown. So that's how that got its start. So I thought that was very interesting because we think of William Penn being in England and getting people to go over. But the fact of the matter is he went specifically to German to pitch the idea of them coming to America. There was a lecture that was given by Dr. George uh, Schweitzer, who is a highly regarded genealogical researcher. And he talked about the ship owners also being very active in recruiting German settlers to the colonies during that time. England was bringing large quantities of cargo back from the colonies. We remember studying that in school, right? And to make the process more profitable, they needed cargo for the westbound journey. So they had cargo that they were taking over. They were making money off going back to Europe, but what they needed was cargo to go back to the colonies so they could uh, make it worth their while. 
um, they weren't as concerned about bringing in money from the human cargo as they were about weight and ballast that could provide to speed up the sailings. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. So the faster they could make the return voyage, the more profits they would realize. How about that for a strategy? The Port of Philadelphia showed the impact of the German recruitment. In 1735, there were 268 German immigrants who arrived at Philadelphia. A year later, it was 736. So it had more than tripled. In 1737, it more than doubled. 1,000 528 German immigrants came to Philadelphia. So when 1738 was coming around in that winter spring, they were expecting even larger number of immigrants. Those higher expectations were shattered by the huge numbers that arrived and they came early in the season. And so this was gonna become an issue this mass surge of immigration from Germany to America. But like I said, these were not the first Germans to arrive in America. German immigrants were among the first Europeans to set foot here and helped establish Jamestown, which was England's settlement in 1608. They also established the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam. Today we call that New York. That was back in 1620. So Germans were actually recruited to come to America because they were considered industrious and honest and hardworking. Uh, some would go to Philadelphia while others were being recruited to go directly to South Carolina. So you've heard of the Pennsylvania Dutch and you've heard of the Dutch for, uh, Fork of South Carolina. Well, it's kind of a misunderstanding in the way the English speaking people heard the word. Uh, because they were Germans, and of course they spoke German, they referred to themselves as Deutsch. Uh, but English speakers heard Dutch, which they weren't Dutch, they were German. But that's where the name stuck, Pennsylvania Dutch or Dutch Fork. Remarkably, um, where in that earlier map that I showed you, um, my husband's ancestors lived 200 miles away from mine in Germany. Mine settled as the Pennsylvania Dutch, his uh, was one of the first settlers in the Dutch Fork area of South Carolina. So I thought that was always interesting. By 1776, the year of our independence, over 100,000 Germans had immigrated to America. Now think about what America was like during that time. There were not, um, you know, a huge population. And when you talk about 100,000 people, that made the German people at that time the largest non-English speaking immigration immigrants uh, group in the history of the country, right? So at this time, as they're coming in early on, of course, they are still under English rule before our independence. This uh, is a depiction of the ship Glasgow, um, and it would be in 1738 that at the age of 45, Johann Daniel Stout and his 17-year-old son Peter from his first marriage to Eva Magdalena Schmidt would embark on a journey that would forever change their lives and the lives of all of their descendants, including me. Later in 1736, or earlier in 1736, Johann uh, would remarry. Um, Ava had died in, earlier in 1736, and later that year he married Anna Elisabetha Keller, Keller, and she would become my seventh great-grandmother, um, That which I thought was really interesting. So two years before he embarked on this journey to America, he had remarried. Since only men over 16 were listed on the ship's manifest, we, we aren't sure, although I have seen documentation that shows that um, Johan and um, Peter, as well as Anna and their daughter, um, sailed with him 
uh, aboard because when you look at the ship's manifest for the Glasgow, it shows just the names of men over the age of 16, but then it shows the total number that would have made up the men, uh, the women and children uh, traveling. So the journey was a difficult one before it even started. The year 1738 was the worst year for immigration to Pennsylvania from Rotterdam. The deteriorating conditions in Europe, the increased solicitation by Newlanders uh, brought even more interest among those yearning for a better life. Thousands of immigrants, more than they ever expected, headed down the Rhine River toward Rotterdam to board a ship. The shipping merchants and officials were bracing, bracing for disaster. Illness, starvation, disease, death from exposure was potentially imminent among this group who had gotten there much too early and in droves. The shipping fleet was not scheduled to return from the colonies to Rotterdam for months. So you had all of these people converging on Rotterdam, all trying to get a seat on those ships. And they actually had to bring in more ships. So it was the Dutch churches that would help give them refuge and ultimately passage. And we, when we think about our ancestors as immigrants, I think we forget this part or we don't think maybe about this part of the story, uh, that they were fleeing religious persecution. They were fleeing famine and war. And, um, you know, one year, one year you might be under this ruler who says you're Catholic and uh, then persecutes all of the Protestants. The next year you might be under the rule of a Protestant and then be persecuted by the Catholics. There, there was just no way that they could, survive, much less thrive in that kind of an environment. And that's where they found themselves. So it, it was easy to understand why so many in 1738 fled Germany. So with the increase in passengers, of course, they had to get creative um, to accommodate everybody. And if you've ever been in one of those ships, it's really neat if you ever get a chance uh, if you're out visiting historical sites and they have one of those ships and you can go in and kind of see how much space there isn't uh, when you're talking about cramming a lot of people into one one uh, ship. Uh, so what they did is they made tiny bunks and they made them three high, three beds high so that they could fit the people into sleep. Uh, they had to do that to make uh, room for everyone to make sure they had enough room for all of the food and supplies that they were going to need for this long journey. Some had to leave their cargo behind. And if you've ever been at the airport and your luggage is lost or it winds up on another plane and they say, Hey, don't worry about it. It'll get there eventually. So some people had to leave their trunks behind. They had to leave their belongings behind because there simply wasn't enough room on this, on the ships. Um, some had to empty their chests. Uh, to empty those crates and things to cram their belongings into the nooks and crannies of the ship as best they could. So they didn't have to leave the little that they had in this world behind. I mean, I can't imagine being through that. But on June 22nd of 1738, Johann and his family boarded the Glasgow in Rotterdam. They made it on the ship. According to accounts, it was a very difficult beginning because there were violent storms that tossed them to and fro. Uh, that became a three week journey. And then once they got to Cowes, just off the English coast, uh, they were looking at probably um, a total of eight to 10 weeks for the entire journey. So Cowes was where they had um, the port, you know, on the Atlantic Ocean. And at that time, you know, that's in England. So all of the ships had to stop in England for customs clearance and to get more supplies and wait for favorable winds. So you get this far in the journey and it's still hurry up and wait. So in September 9th, on September 9th, 1738, now remember, we really don't know how long they were in Rotterdam. They could have been there for a few months because everybody was getting there early. 
to make sure they got a spot on the ships, on one of the ships. Um, but by June 22nd, they were headed to Rotterdam. So June 22nd to September 9th, uh, they could have been there earlier, but we know on September 9th that they finally arrived in Philadelphia and they took the Oath of Allegiance when they landed in the colonies. And of course, the Oath of Allegiance uh, was to um, Britain because we were still under English rule and to the province of Pennsylvania. So after um, 12 years after settling in the Pennsylvania colony, and a lot of the people, one of the questions that uh, that I got from someone was, um, you know, what did the poor people do and, you know, paying for their passage and a lot of them would become indentured servants. We learned about that in school too. Some of those families even had to sell their children as basically servants or slaves to be able to afford the passage and work the passage off to make their way to America. I don't know that that was the stout situation based on what I've seen so far. I don't think so because some of the stouts were, they had trades and, and they had businesses. Many of them in Germany during that time were in positions of leadership. And um, so I'm think, I don't think that they were, but I know that they settled in uh, Pennsylvania for a while because 12 years after they landed there, in 1750, on November 23rd, Godfrey Daniel Stout was born in the Springsville Township there in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and he would become the first of my ancestors on this branch of my family tree to be born in America. And Johann and his family would remain in Pennsylvania until at least around 1760, and that's because of the next land grant that you see on the screen there. His son, Peter, who, of course, came to America as a 17-year-old by this time. He's a grown man with a family of his own. He remained in Pennsylvania, and he is, of course, buried there. So let's talk about the next leg of their journey. Of course, now we have gone from Germany to Rotterdam to England to Philadelphia. And we've gone from 1738 and now we're looking at the, the 1760s, the mid 1700s is where we are in our journey. Now, to kind of give you a little background on the story here, by 1730, Virginia the, changed, the colony of Virginia changed their laws. Uh, they offered to grant land speculators a thousand acres for every family they could settle west of the Blue Ridge. That's an incentive, right? Talk about a carrot. This law was uh, really intended to create buffer settlements. And they wanted Scots-Irish and German immigrants to move to the mountains to protect the older settlements in the Piedmont and the Tidewater regions. Part of that was protection against uh, the Indians, the Native Americans at the time. Um, by the time Johann, now you got to remember 1738, people, Germans have been coming to America close to what, 75, 80 years, if not more. So by the time Johann got to Philadelphia, as far as looking for land, because that's what, again, remember land was everything in Germany. If you had land, if you had property, that was your status, that was your wealth. Um, but by the time he got here, even in 1738, there was less land available in Pennsylvania. Uh, you also were dealing with people who had, who were there as second and third generations who were inheriting property. So they weren't selling and the cheap and fertile land in the Shenandoah Valley was very appealing to the Germans. Um, so here we go again, they're going to pack up. And they're going to leave Philadelphia and they're going to head for the Shenandoah Valley. The English monarchy had figured it out. They needed sturdy settlers in this area to ward off the Native Americans and to prevent their enemies, the French, uh, from gaining a stronghold in the New West. So they didn't want the French getting any more territory. So by basically settling those areas and finding those people who were sturdy, scrappy people. Um, that was their plan. 
So as Germans, they would feel a natural duty toward protecting their new homeland from their former enemies. Remember, before they left Germany, they were constantly at war with France. So if you ask them, hey, would you go and protect our new country from the French? Of course, they're going to say yes. Um, and this would play into the American Revolution later on. Matter of fact, uh, Godfrey Daniel Stout's father-in-law served in the American Revolution. He guarded Hessian prisoners of war. Um, and considering that the English fought with the Germans against the French overseas, it's really interesting to think that the Germans would have become patriots. You would have thought they would have kept their loyalty to England because England had tried to protect them against the French when really they were just fighting against the French. Um, but the Hessians, of course, you know, um, mercenary soldiers, a lot, there was, there was really some angst um, in America after all of this because a lot of people would think of the Germans as the Hessians and they weren't the same thing. Um, you know, they were as American as everybody by this point. But that's why I think you personally, I think uh, that's why you saw a lot of anglicizing of the names about this time to lose the German identity because of its connections. Perhaps that's just my theory. So by 1761, we're headed to Shenandoah Valley. Johann Daniel Stout received a land grant of 450 acres from Lord Fairfax along Stony Creek, Virginia. And this is a photo that I took of the area. Uh, this would actually be part of the 150 acres that Godfrey Daniel Stout would eventually inherit. And, and the picture doesn't do it justice. It is an absolutely breathtaking area. And uh, they're in Edinburgh, Virginia, one of my favorite places to go and visit. So this is actually when you see the DS 450. Uh, he went by Daniel Stout. Uh, this little area right here, you see where those little things are. This is where Daniel Stout's area was. This, I believe, the circle is where they had put um, his mother when Johann um, Daniel Stout passed away. Um, he actually died on August 7th of 1770. Uh, Elizabeth, his wife, remarried John Berger, who came over on the Glasgow with them from Germany. And so she remarried and the sons built her, they built them a house for them to live on, on the property. And, uh, but Godfrey Daniel, John and George Benjamin uh, were all came there to live with their parents and they would actually inherit 150 acres each of that plantation. Um, and I believe Elizabeth passed away in about 1779. Now, this area um, the, of where the property is, like I said, is, is west from Edinburgh, Virginia. And it is now uh, the, the whole property, part of it, the northern part, I believe, was once a Christmas tree farm. I'm not sure about that anymore. It's been a few years since I've been up there. I'm ready to go back for another visit. And uh, but Godfrey Daniels uh, Stout property is now the site. And, and this is part of the George Washington National Forest, which is protected, um, but is part of the Strotterman Camp for Girls, which I just found so wonderful that it's being used for that. And, and I hate to say it, but it hasn't been developed and it's still beautiful and it's being used for such a, uh, a wonderful purpose. Um, we do have a lot of accounts about Godfrey Daniel Stout serving as a captain in the American Revolution. Some accounts place him at the Battle of Kings Mountain. You'll notice I'm intentionally talking in disclaimers because there are others say, because there was a lot of Godfrey Daniel Stouts. The name was used Daniel Stout uh, very frequently. Uh, my brother is a Daniel Stout. Um, but there are many that have said that, no, he did not serve in the American Revolution. However, he is on the Daughters of American uh, Revolution roles. So I'm going to side with them because they tend to be very, very conservative and uh, base it on the citations that they receive. Um, so I've heard stories that um, the reason why he settled in Tennessee was because during the revolution, he came to this area, fell in love with it. 
Uh, I have read other accounts of where his vast land ownings, ownings uh, brought him uh, to Washington County and Sullivan County and this whole area that he had been here uh, for different reasons. But whatever, I'm just really glad that he did. Um, when he, when after Elizabeth had passed away and they had inherited the plantation, uh, they had leased out a lot of their land over the years. But, uh, but I do believe that Godfrey Daniel Stout sold his 150 acres to Ulrich Wagner, who, when you look at all of the names, which you can't see the names on this map, and the map is absolutely huge, this plat map. Um, it has all of the names that are people there. So if you are from Northeast Tennessee and you know that your family's migrated from the Shenandoah Valley area, you will see a lot of those very common names, the Grindstaffs, the Smith Peters, uh, the Wagners. So there's, there's all of those names that, that came down um, together. So having been there and I'm really excited about the possibilities of getting back there again this year, spent a lot of time at the Shenandoah Valley Library, plan to go to the Frederick County Courthouse and doing some research because a lot of the records are up there. And uh, but this is an absolutely beautiful part of, of Virginia to to visit. So Godfrey Daniel would marry Katerina Boltzen. Uh, some have Voltson. Again, we're going into the, the German. Uh, but they married March 3rd of 1772 in the Shenandoah Valley, where Katerina was born. Both of her parents were born in Germany and uh, immigrated later than the Stouts did, but they all wound up in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and I believe that about this time, you know, we know that they were there through probably um, the late 1700s, which this is, you know, after the American Revolution. But I believe that uh, Godfrey and Katerina probably immigrated to or migrated to um, Northeast Tennessee around 1790. And the reason why I think that is because in September of that year, her parents gave her a German prayer book. And this was the inscription that was in the front of her German prayer book. book. And of course, it was written in German. Um, so that to me was very exciting that here we are in 1790. They've been there since 1738 and they've still retained their language, which the Germans, you know, were a very, very tight community. And so I was glad to see that that was still part of their culture, that they had not, um, they had not lost that. And so this was in her prayer book. And so I think based on the dates of when uh, Godfrey and Katerina would have come to Northeast Tennessee, this may have been a gift that they gave their daughter um, before she left to come here, not knowing if, um, if they would see each other again, because they would be getting older. And um, I think in 1811, her father passed away. And so you think about when people left each other then, now we can Zoom and we can FaceTime and, you know, we can hop on a plane, but then seeing your loved ones, once they left, you never knew, you know, if you were going to see them again. What I really find amazing about this, again, it was written in German, but it was translated into English. That's why we have the English translation by Martin Vadwitz, who was a chemist of the American uh, Glensoff Corporation um, over in Elizabethton. Uh, and he did that in August of 1933. He was a native of Germany. And what really kind of gave me, you know how that moment when you're kind of looking at your family tree and you're working on your genealogy and you, you jump onto something and you go, wait a minute, and you get goosebumps. Well, this was one of those goosebump moments because earlier that year in 1933, in March of 1933, my grandparents were married. So I know that even as of 1933, somewhere between Carter County and Johnson County, my sixth great grandmother's prayer book that her parents gave her as she came here, somebody had it in their hands. Somebody got it, you know, they got it translated and I would love to know who has it and where it is today, 
but that just excited me to no end when I saw that that was within the same year. So the journey continues. Now the map that you see there is of the Watauga settlement. So there was a period before North Carolina, Virginia, uh, that we, if you look there, you'll see the Watauga settlement, you'll see the Doe River, you'll see the Watauga River. Those pieces would become Tennessee. So according to the research that I have found in 1774, Godfrey Daniel held 1,475 acres on Lord Fairfax rental rolls uh, throughout Dunmore in, in Shenandoah County, Virginia. He was considered a wealthy farmer. Uh, he traveled up and down the Shenandoah River to Sullivan County into Carter County, Tennessee. Um, holding land on the left bank of the Holston River near Jacobs Creek. Other research shows that he paid taxes in Washington County, North Carolina in 1794. He lived in Pandora in a log house on the bank of the Doe River, which was deeded to his son, David D. Stout. Now I've read accounts, and I'll show you that in a second, about a wooden block table that he had that David also inherited. Back again in 1933, I found a notation that there was a Mr. Doggett living in old Godfrey Daniel's cabin that was still standing in 1933 because he was living there. So I would love to find the prayer book, the table, and the site of that cabin. That has become my quest um, because any family that settled Tennessee before 1796 is considered a first family of Tennessee and Godfrey Daniel moved here and had property here. Um, the Stout family qualifies as a first family of Tennessee. Uh, so these are a couple of the stories that I found. The one on the right uh, is about the, uh, the table and it gives the description of the table. And I've already talked to a few people who own antique stores around here and said, if you find anything like this, please let me know. I am looking for it. Um, so I love that story, but I really love the story there on the left that I found about Godfrey Daniel Stout, uh, about a bear that saved his life. It seems that he was walking through the woods one day when he espied a panther crossing a log coming toward him. The panther was followed by a bear. The panther and the bear got in a fight, which resulted in both falling off the log dead. And it saved the life of Godfrey Daniel Stout. I love those kind of kind of uh, stories. So um, wealth and success gave, you know, that was what it was, having that land. So you kind of understand, it, you know, I remember there, there's a movie and there's a line in the movie that says, you ain't no kind of man if you ain't got land. I think it was old brother or out there you know, paraphrasing a bit, but, uh, but I understood that and it really helped me connect to understand why my father felt that way and his grand, his father felt that way and why I grew up feeling that way is that having land ha is not just property or houses, but it's the land. When you come to Appalachia and you're trying to understand the locals and, and you, you try to wrap your mind around why their land is not just property. It's them. It, it is in their soul. When you understand where they came from and their ancestry and how that DNA is programmed in them, then you can really kind of understand uh, the people of Appalachia. Of course, Godfrey Daniel uh, uh, Katerina passed away in 1843 and Godfrey Daniel passed away in 1846. Both of them are buried up on the uh, Asa Shound Cemetery. Um, but descendants erected this stone on the right in his honor. Now you will notice that his date of birth is 1757. He was actually born in 1750. So that is a, an error. But, you know, uh, like I said, genealogy is a journey. You, you learn a lot along the way. But you can visit this and see it. And uh, it is there and something that the family is quite proud of. So this is a page um, when one of our family members uh, passed on, uh, they gave their book of genealogy to one of my aunt and uncles. 
and this is actually a little bit more about my family and like I said genealogy is a journey you see where they were kind of working on this and trying to get the dates um, and of course I filled in some of uh, those blanks and we have an, in my direct line we have the Stouts and we have the Andrews and the Greenwells and of course that come down to Noble who is my grandfather um, originally the name when it came over on our end of the family was spelled this way it's been spelled so many different ways uh, for a while I believe my great-grandfather spelled our last name with an E uh, my grandfather I believe dropped the E and uh, we're just plain old stouts my fifth great-grandparents George Peter Stout he married Elizabeth Potter I wish I could find, you know, of course, photos when they existed and everything. It would be wonderful. My fourth great grandparents, I have another Daniel Stout. He married Sarah Polly Potter. I haven't found a lot out about George Peter or Daniel Stout. I'm still digging, still searching. Hopefully I'll learn more as we go along. My third great grandparents were uh, John Russell Stout. He married Elizabeth Bunton. And since moving here, I have met some buttons and it's like, wow, we're related. Um, and then, of course, my second great grandparents. Uh, my second great grandfather here is George Thomas Stout, uh, GT, or they called him Tom. And uh, over in the Pogi Pandora area along uh, the Elks Mills area, Elks River. And he married Louisa Lou Franklin. Now, Lou... Uh, died in childbirth in 1898 and um, great great grandpa Tom remarried uh, Sue Henson and it was really wonderful because I got to make the acquaintance of a lady who wrote a book called Back on Nowhere Road and when I was a little girl and I would ask my dad where are you from he'd say nowhere and I never understood that I thought again everybody's pulling my leg he would tell me nowhere and I'm like how can you be from nowhere and then when I came here and uh, began really researching the family and trying to understand, I ran across Ms. Van Landingham's book and I got really excited and I read it and I had an opportunity to sit down and meet with her and talk with her and just absolutely loved, you know, hearing her stories um, about Nowhere Road and Nowhere because it is a real place. It exists. And that's where my family was from nowhere it's an absolutely beautiful place by the way this is my great grandfather james alvin stout um, sadly he died at age 42 from uh, black lung from working in the mines um, my great grandmother uh, fanny adeline andrews and uh, she died in 1970 and she's buried over in butler where the family lived and um, if you've been to the uh, Johnson County Welcome Center and Museum, there's a gift shop there. And if you thumb through the local history books that are for sale there, you're going to see this picture. And one day I'm in the museum gift shop and I'm looking through the books and I stop and I go, I know this picture because this is a picture of my grandfather, Noble, his baby brother, Ursel. And, of course, his big sister, Hazel Stout. And so it's really kind of fun when you're in different places and you're like, wow, there's there's a picture of my granddad when he was a grumpy three-year-old. Uh, this is my grandparents. Uh, this photo on the far left is a photo of my grandmother, grandfather, and her friend, Flossie. And this photo hangs in the Beach Mountain uh, History Museum. It was taken by uh, W.H. Trivet, and uh, he took quite a few pictures of my grandmother when she was younger. Of course, we're related to the Trivets. Uh, my grandmother is from the Beach Mountain area, related to the Harmons and the church and the Trivets and the triplets. She used to tell me when I was a girl, we got a lot of triplets in our family. Of course, I finally figured out what she meant. Um, but uh, that, are, that is my, uh, my grandparents. And it was really funny because the first time I went to the uh, Beach Mountain Historical Museum, I'm walking through and the lady doing the tour is doing such a wonderful job. And I get to the back wall and I just stop and I'm going, I know that woman on the wall. And she looked at me and she's like, well, 
how do you know her? And I said, well, the one on the left is my grandmother. And, um, and they had always wondered who those people were, never knew it was a picture in, in an exhibit. And it turned out that it was, it was mine. Um, these are the interview papers. When the Tennessee Valley Authority came to the Butler area, uh, they interviewed the families that had farms there. And my, of course, here they misspelled my grandfather's name. His name was Noble, not Noble. Uh, but they interviewed the families. And this is the interview that they did with my grandparents. And when I think about my grandparents being in their early 30s with six children, and they're having to leave a life that, you know, Butler at that time was a wonderful, before that time, was a wonderful little middle class community. I also volunteer for the, uh, the Butler Museum. So if you get a chance to come over there, I'll be happy to give you a tour uh, and to tell you their story, but uh, which is my family's story. But, uh, but they did have to leave Butler. It was going to be a hardship. Uh, my grandfather's brother had uh, found an, um, opportunities in back in Virginia, believe it or not. And so they packed up their children uh, one night. And my uh, one of my aunts has told me the story um, of how she was about 10 or 11 at the time. They thought they were going on vacation. They thought they were going on a holiday. Um, they didn't know that they weren't coming back. And they didn't know what was happening as children. And I could understand wanting to protect your children from that grief because that was a very emotionally uh, distraught time for so many families here in, um, in the Johnson County area uh, along the Watauga in Butler. But, uh, but they did leave. So they were one of the families displaced. Uh, they actually moved back to where it all began back to Virginia. Um, so this is the family farm. This photo is probably taken, I believe, might have been in the mid 70s, I'm guessing, maybe toward the, um, I would think, because uh, for the longest, it didn't have the front porch. And I believe my uncles added the front porch. I remember growing up, uh, we would come, I grew up in Southeast Alabama. This was the family farm, some 14 hours away in Virginia and Cumberland. And uh, when I was a little girl, uh, no indoor plumbing that got added. So I do know the joys of going to the outhouse during winter in the snow. Um, we also caught a lot of fireflies. My grandmother grew the most incredible sunflowers you've ever seen and the best pole beans you've ever eaten. And, uh, and I remember taking baths in the big um, metal tub in the middle of the kitchen. So I did grow up with those experiences and are great. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful for them because those, those are some really wonderful memories. The barn's not there. That's a whole other story. But uh, but anyway, that is a picture of the farm. And uh, my we have family that still lives there. And we've been there for about 75 years now. Uh, this is uh, a couple of years after they left Butler, Tennessee, after the, the TVA came in and uh, created Watauga Lake. Uh, the handsome fellow on the far left, tall, straight, is my dad, Bobby Lee. He was about 10, I think, at this time. Uh, we have Jack Stout. We have Larry Stout. All three of them were born in Butler, in Old Butler. And then sitting on top of my grandpa's lap is the first of our family to be born back in Virginia. And that is my uncle Teddy, who lives in Virginia even now. Um, this is my dad and mom. Uh, my dad, of course, Bobby Lee Stout. Uh, they met while he was in the service in Southeast Alabama, where my mother is from, and they were married in 1961. Um, and this is my family. Oh, my gosh. Many years ago. I'm trying to remember even. This was like 1996. I think this photo was taken. That is my father. He's wearing the stout sweatshirt that I made him by hand. Uh, we put the family crest on there for him. My mom, my daughter, Elise, uh, my son, Christopher. And that is my little brother, Daniel Stout. And of course, 
this was taken in 2021. Uh, this was probably about four or five months before we moved out here to Tennessee. It was always my dream from the time that I was brought here when I was 10 years old to see where the family was from. I fell in love with this part of Tennessee. To me, it is to me, it's the most beautiful place on earth. I, I'm a little prejudiced, uh, but I absolutely love it here. Dreamed all of my life of eventually uh, living here. And when my husband, Billy, retired in 2021, um, you know, I've worked from home most of my career the last 10, 12 years. And uh, so it was an easy transition for us. Hard to leave family, but, uh, but we absolutely love it here. Uh, there is my daughter now with her two daughters. Uh, her oldest is graduating high school this week, which just blows my mind. My brother, Daniel, his wife, uh, Lori, and daughter, Katie, and then my son, Christopher, and his family. The little Jack there is uh, our youngest grandchild, and he's graduating preschool uh, this week. So our family has continued uh, to grow and to flourish. And of course, there is my mom still with us. As a matter of fact, right now, she's staying with us here in Tennessee and absolutely loving the mountains and the fresh air and the sounds of birds and the slower pace of life here. But um, but we're really enjoying having her here. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, just post them below. I will be happy to answer them. But thank you so much for your time.